Parivci. Hello, everybody. This is the Musalert dialect. Parivci is means is hello. Um, in the name of ARPA Institute, I will welcome you all and thank you all for participating in our presentations. Today, I thought I would organize my presentation in terms of uh, the transition from Proto-Indo-European, the ancestor of uh, the Musalair dialect in around 4000 BC up to 2021. We are fortunate with um, the Musalair varieties to still have a number of speakers, whereas unfortunately, most of the 500 plus varieties of Armenian are, are not in even that good of shape. <clears throat> Let's start off with a little teaser. <clears throat> I have a little video here of Hagop Konosian, who has kindly helped me out extensively today with uh, linguistic material. I'm gonna play you a video of him saying something very short, and then we're gonna have a poll where you can try to guess what he is saying in Musalair dialect. Here we go. Okay, I'll play it one more time and then we'll bring up the poll. Okay, uh, Jora, can you put up the poll now? Yes. Let me see if I can play it again while the poll is showing. All right, everyone, have a um, guess at what Agop is saying, the English translation of this Musalair utterance. And when you're done, hit submit, and then we'll see a report on what everyone has guessed. I'll give you all about a minute or two to enter in your answers. <clears throat> Here it is again. All right, one more time and then we'll see what results we have. Jora, can we see um, what the results are so far? Yes. Okay, where are you coming from uh, is the majority form people have picked. Uh, followed by where did she find it, followed by the world is round, and then buttery lentils and issues aren't there. Didn't get many uh, selections. The answer is, in fact, uh, where did she find it? So here on the slide, I've given you a transcription of the Mosalair utterance, so yamur and then yakaldze where it means from where did he, she, or it find it. And I picked this example to illustrate not only how different the Musalar dialect is from other varieties of Armenian you may be familiar with, but also to show some of the points of linguistic interest that show up even in a small sample of the dialect. So here we can see, for example, that the I of uh, is the outcome of the classical Armenian E prefix that was used in the third person singular aorist form. So the ancestor of this form um, in classical Armenian was egit, meaning he, she, or it found, where git is the root to find in classical Armenian. And that in turn comes from the Indo-European root, wid, meaning to see. 
or to know. Um, and then it has the prefix e before it that was used in the Indo-Iranian branch and the Greek branch and the Armenian branch of Indo-European to mark um, aorist or other past tense forms, depending on the language branch. We can also see that the original Indo-European W, when before a vowel became G in Armenian. And what's a particular interest here is that this G has actually become a voiceless uvular stop in this particular form in Musalara, so the, um, where you might have expected it to come out as a K in this particular form. Uh, we'll talk more about that later today. You can also see that um, this verb shifted um, conjugation class from the I class of Egit into the A class. And then that underwent the regular shift in Musaler and the other Cilician and Syrian dialects to O. But then under certain conditions we'll talk about later today, that O can be lengthened to Ao. So you end up getting this diphthong ao in the second syllable of the verb, which is very rare in Armenian dialects today. So early classical Armenian had ao, but it shifted to o in almost every variety of Armenian. But then some of the dialects in uh, Cilicia, uh, in Syria specifically redeveloped an ao. <clears throat> and then you can also see that from egit, we had the regular development of that in um, the Cilician and Syrian dialects to a D. But then when you combine that with the Z of the following um, um, enclitic pronoun, Z meaning it, it combines D plus Z to give what's written as a Z plus a Z, but it's pronounced by Hagop as a sort of Z. So an unreleased T plus a Z together. All of these features are highly unusual in the Armenian dialect world. Um, the preservation of the old classical Armenian accusative prefix Z is also relatively unusual, though you do also find that in the dialects around the Mush area in Eastern Turkey historically. But it has um, mutated into something you can also use as a clitic pronoun that you attach at the right edge of a verb. So the z, the z at the end of yakaldza is this old z accusative marker that now means it as a, a clitic object. You find something um, similar in dialects of Armenian in Iran, but using uh, instead the s, d, n forms rather than z. <clears throat> so that's a little teaser for you of Musaler. And now let's launch into the heart of the talk. My plan for today is we're first going to cover some historical and general context about Musaler dialect. Then we'll go through some details of how the Indo-European proto-language developed into the present-day Musaler dialects. And then we'll look at some archaisms or preservations of old features in our, um, the Armenian family in the morphological domain. So the domain of word formation. And then we'll look at some innovations in Musaler in the phonological domain, or roughly speaking, the pronunciation domain. And then at the end for fun, I'm going to have a little tidbit of paremiology or the study of uh, sayings and so on. Okay, let's start with some historical and general context. What and where is Musaler? Probably most of you in the audience will already know the answer to this, but I've prepared for the possibility that some of you are not Armenian or may not speak Armenian or may not be familiar with this particular variety of Armenian. So those of you who are actually from Musaler, um, I hope you'll bear with me during these bits. Musaler uh, literally means Moses, Musa, Ler, the Armenian word for mountain. So it refers to the mountain of Moses, which is here up on the map about 18 kilometers west of classical Antioch, modern day Antakya, uh, very close to the Mediterranean coast. <clears throat> and the Armenian name for this area is Musaler, 
And then there's a region down below the mountain, um, which in Armenia is sometimes called Sevedia, uh, which is an Arabic borrowing. In Turkish, this area and the mountain were originally called Musadava or Musadav. Um, but now it tends to be called Samanda or Samandava. And then in Arabic, the name is Jebel Musa. So you may have heard some or all of these to refer to the same entity, which is this mountain of Moses and the villages surrounding it historically. Where is and where was the Musa where dialect spoken? I'm gonna to focus today on the original villages around the mountain of Moses, um, but we'll talk very quickly also about the diaspora after 1915. So in the upper right corner, I've given you a close up of the main villages where the Musalara dialect was spoken originally. And I've color coded them to the three main sub dialects of Musalara. So <clears throat> people traditionally say in the Armenian dialect world that there are three sub dialects of Musalara. There's what they call the Yonoluk sub dialect which was spoken in Yonoluk and Khudrbek and Vakuf, which are the blue dots in the map. Now, if you look at um, Turkish maps or even Google maps, you'll see their Turkish names used instead. So Yonoluk, Khudrbe, and Vakufle. Um, Ataturk had a scheme to change all of the non-Turkish place names in Turkey. Uh, that took place over a span of 40 or 50 years, starting in the 1920s. Um, but interestingly, um, some of the names of the Armenian villages in this area survived relatively unaltered, probably because to the engineers of this memory erasure program, they didn't look like Armenian place names. Um, then up higher up the mountain side, we have Bitias and Haji Habibli, um, which formed another sub-dialect. Bitias is now called Batı Ayaz, so it's been Turkified, the name of it. Haji Habibli is not listed in any, name, any form approximately close to Haji Habibli in pronunciation, but it seems to be where there's a new Turkish village called Eriklikuyu. Um, so I've labeled current Eric Likuyu as Haji Habibli, but I cannot guarantee that that new uh, village that was formed was put on the uh, site of old Armenian Haji Habibli. If any of you have inside information about that, email me or send me a comment. And then finally, the third sub-dialect is typically called the Kabusie dialect, um, the modern name for that village is Kapı Suyu. So they've Turkified the old name. And then it was uh, spoken originally in Chevlik or Chavrik and Maharachuk. So these are the areas where Musalar dialect was primarily spoken until 1915. And I asked Hago to pronounce the original Armenian names of these, which you can see in this chart on this slide. And I've given you Armenian versions and IPA, International Phonetic Alphabet transcriptions of them, along with their standard Armenian names and their modern Turkish names. So here's Hago pronouncing them from top to bottom. Betyus, Hablak, Gabisuk, Makhov, Idder, Yonolo. Okay, so I'll play them one more time for you. Betyus, Hablak, Gabisuk, Makhov, Idder, Yonolo. You'll notice here, among other things, that a Q shows up twice in Makhov and uh, in some people's pronunciations of Yonoluk. Um, also, you'll notice a feature that's unusual in Armenian dialects, which is geminate or long consonants, like in ider, or um, um, what's now called in Turkish hudrbe, or traditional hudrbek. So those are the classic villages of the Musalaya region. 
What happened after 1915 when the Ottomans came in, as we all know, um, there was a heroic resistance against the Ottoman attempt to wipe out the uh, Armenian communities of this area. And um, the survivors eventually were saved on a French ship and taken to Port Said in Egypt. They then returned in 1919 um, and ultimately were taken at least in part to Haigatasht, um, just a little bit south of the villages we've been talking about so far. And then in 1939, there were larger um, migrations to Anjar in Lebanon, and there still is a community, um, the last surviving one in this area of Armenians in Bakuf or modern Bakuf Le. And then in 1946, there was a return to the homeland, as it were, where many Musalertsis went to um, the Republic of Armenia in the Soviet Union. <clears throat> and they went to a number of specific places, including Nor Musaler, New Musaler, Nor Aresh, New Aresh, and so on. The main diaspora settlement for Musaler Armenians um, was Anjar. And that you can see a picture, you can see it's a planned um, town on the corner of old Umayyad ruins. And interestingly, the Musaler villages were each put in a specific subpart originally of Anjar. So the uh, villagers from Kabusie were put in the top left bit, the villagers from Yonoluk just below them, and so on. And this uh, separation of the um, inhabitants of the original six villages seems to have played a part in the subdialects of those villages remaining distinct to the point where if you speak with older speakers today, they, they often will still have their own uh, original sub variety. Though so Hagop was telling me earlier that uh, younger speakers have uh, begun to mix those together. Also famously, um, in Armenia, the Republic of Armenia, there are a few uh, diaspora settlements of Musaler Armenians. So for example, if you look at the 1984 ethnographic collection of Musaler stories of um, the 1915 defense, folk tales, et cetera, uh, correct, collected by Virginie Savazlian, you'll find that one of her informants was Hagob Derbedrosian here in the left side of the slide. He was from Yohnoluk. He was actually born there in 1908. So he was quite young when his family had to flee to uh, Port Said. He came back to Yohnoluk in 1919. But then in 1927, he went to Beirut and then to Aleppo where his son Levon was born and um, in 1945. And then right after that, the family moved to Nor Adesh, which is on the south side of Yerevan today. And that's where Levon grew up. And eventually he became the first president of the new Republic of Armenia, as I'm sure you all know. <clears throat> so Nor Adesh is one of the other diaspora settlements of Musaler Armenians, uh, in addition to containing people from Adesh in Azerbaijan. Okay, now let's move on to the development of the Musaler dialect from Indo-European. Our starting point for considering this issue is the modern varieties of Armenian. There are 120 different varieties of modern Armenian studied in Gevork Jahukyan's 1972 Introduction to Armenian Dialects. Three of them are the three sub-dialects of uh, the Musaler area, but there are many others covered. Van, uh, Norjuha, Agulis, Tiflis, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But actually, um, beyond these 120 varieties of Armenian that Jahukian uh, documents, more than 500 varieties of modern Armenian have been documented in the Dialect Institute's database. Um, they in Yerevan. They produced in the 70s a manual for the collection of dial Armenian dialect material. And they then sent out field workers to more than 500 locations. And they collected about um, answers to about 700 
uh, lexical and grammatical questions, and they collected specific folk tales as well. So the Armenian dialect world is extremely rich and varied compared to what you find in with other languages in the world. On top of these um, 500 varieties that the Dialect Institute worked on, there are others that you can't find um, typically reported on. So Aresh that I mentioned, um, the one of the bases of this Nor Aresh community, it was an Armenian settlement in uh, Northeast Azerbaijan that is not reported on in Jahukian's book. The Baghdad Armenian community and the Basra communities each had their own varieties of Armenian, at least before the US invasion in the 90s. Um, <clears throat> Jerusalem had its own Armenian dialect um, until the late 90s. Um, Tehran has a mixed dialect of Armenian that's quite interesting. Um, then there are many, many kinds, I would say even hundreds of varieties of Hamshen Armenian spoken in Northeast Turkey and in Abkhazia and the contiguous part of Russia. And there were also some varieties spoken in Central Asia, um, but I think those communities after the fall of the Soviet Union um, largely moved westward again. Then in Northern uh, Iraq, and Iran, you, um, you can also find Armenian communities that haven't been studied, um, such as Zaho in Northern Iraq. Uh, I've worked with some refugees from there um, who spoke the local variety of Armenian. <clears throat> On top of those, there are some mixed languages as we call them in linguistics that have an Armenian base to them. So for example, Lomavren is a mixed language where the grammar is from the Erzurum dialect of Armenian, but the lexicon or the words come from an Indic language uh, that was brought with the gypsies from India. Um, those who ended up originally in Northeast uh, Anatolia ended up uh, speaking this language called Lomavren, which is still spoken today in parts of the Republic of Armenia and parts of the West of Turkey. Uh, especially in Istanbul. Um, Armeno Kupchak was a mixed language that was spoken in Eastern Europe um, until fairly recently. There are actually many publications about uh, Armeno Kupchak by uh, Schutz and a few others. And then uh, Armeno Turkish is a richly documented and um, um, literarily attested variety of Armenian that um, was written in Armenian script. It uh, is described superficially as a kind of Turkish, but it actually has a large amount of uh, Armenian lexical and grammatical content to it as well. So with all of these hundreds of varieties of modern Armenian, how did we develop this rich variety coming from a single Indo-European proto-language. Well, the first step in the development was that the Indo-European proto-language began to split apart sometime between 4000 BC and about 2500 BC. And it ended up producing many descendants. The first uh, set of Indo-Europeans to split off from the main family seems to have been what became the Anatolian language group. So they um, stayed where the Armenians, uh, where the Indo-Europeans may have started according to uh, Indo-Europeanist Eric Hamp in um, Eastern Anatolia, the An Armenian homeland also. So the Anatolian family is Hittite, Luvian, Lycian, languages like that, Carian. Then the next groups to split off according to this tree on the right side of the slide, which comes I think from Don Ringe, an Indo-Europeanist at uh, Penn, were Tocharian, which ended up in China, and the Italo-Celtic family, which ended up in um, largely in Western Europe. Um, then according to this grouping, uh, Greek and Armenian split off and they later separated from each other. Um, this grouping is not universally accepted, by the way. So some Indo-Europeanists think that Greek and Armenian did not form a common sub-branch of Indo-European, but others think they did. 
Other linguists believe that Greek and Armenian also grouped with the Indo-Iranian family. Um, there are numerous reasons for this. They share many features in common. If you're interested in this question of the relationship between Armenian, Greek, and Indo-Iranian, I recommend James Claxon's book on this topic, which is uh, clearly written and very uh, thoroughly argued. Then the next branches to split off were the Germanic and Balto-Slavic groups. So that would include Lithuanian and Russian and Polish and German and English and Icelandic and so on. And the end result is that in this little branch of the tree here in the very center of the Indo-European tree, you end up having Armenian as a separate uh, family within the Indo-European language group. And put in more linguistic terms, if you start with Indo-European, one of the key changes that separated Armenian from the other Indo-European daughters was they had a set of consonant shifts where original Indo-European B, D, and G, and so on, so plain voice stops, de-voiced. So <clears throat> for example, the word for 10 in Indo-European was decumt, and that comes out in classical Armenian with a T. Dasen, and uh, we'll see what happens to that in Musalar later. And then the original voiceless unaspirated stops of Indo-European, aspirated in Armenian. <clears throat> um, <clears throat> so for example, um, in the number for eight, okto in Indo-European, you get ut with an aspirated T in classical Armenian. And then the third set of con stop consonants in Indo-European were called voiced aspirates like D, B, and so on, like you still hear today in Hindi and actually in a lot of dialects of Armenian, Nujolfa, Mush, and so on, uh, Sivas. These lost their aspiration in old or classical Armenian. So for example, um, beremi, meaning I carry in Indo-European, became berem in classical Armenian with an unaspirated B. <clears throat> and then the next stage moving down this uh, temporal tree to Musaler was from the Proto-Armenian uh, grouping, a Southwestern dialect group split off where the um, plain voiceless and plain voiced series of uh, classical and common Armenian switched with each other, apparently. So original T became D, original D became T. And this Southwestern group contains the Cilician dialects. So Marash, Zeytun, Hajan, and then originally Sis and a few others, uh, Furnus and so on. And also the Syrian dialects. So Belan, Kassab, Aramo, Musaler, etc. <clears throat> and within the Southwestern group, um, this Syrian group then split into two. One that deleted the definite article, as we'll see later. Um, so Khurbek, Kabusie, Yolnuluk um, deleted the old definite article in most cases. And then a group that preserved the definite article, which includes Haji Habibli, Bitias, Vakuf, but also Kesab and Aramo and Belan. So within the Syrian varieties of Armenian, the traditional ones, so I'm not counting Damascus and Aleppo and so on right now. Um, within the traditional Syrian dialects, there isn't actually a clean break between Musaler and Kesab and Aramo and so on. There's a sort of mix. Uh, <clears throat> which we um, model in linguistics with what's called the wave model of linguistics de linguistic development rather than the traditional tree model. Okay, now let's go from classical Armenian to Musaler, now that we've already uh, done a bit from Indo-European to classical or old Armenian. Let's start with the consonant shift I alluded to which happened in Cilician Middle Armenian, uh, or at least it had occurred by the time of the documents from the uh, 11th to the 15th centuries that we have from Cilicia in Armenian. <clears throat> so 
to make sense of what happened with the consonants, we need to discuss a concept that was actually developed by Hrachia Ajarian, the greatest Armenian linguist, and I would say one of the greatest linguists of any ethnicity um, who has existed in the last 200 plus years. Um, he did his PhD in Paris with Antoine Meillet, a famous Indo-Europeanist who was very interested in Armenian and actually spent time studying in Ichmiadzin. Um, but he did his phonetic work with the Abbe Rousselot, who was one of the earliest phoneticians to use um, uh, actual machinery to study the acoustic properties of human speech. And working with Rousselot, um, Ajarian already knew about the differences in pronunciation of the consonants across the Armenian dialect world. And he mentioned these differences to Rousselot and they set out to try to figure out what acoustic parameters or articulatory parameters were actually distinguishing the pronunciations in the seven main groups of Armenian dialects. And what Ajarian came up with was this thing we now call voice onset time, which refers to the amount of time between when you release a closure in your mouth and when your vocal folds start vibrating to make a vowel following that consonant. So let's say that I make the uh, syllable ba. To make the B, I close my lips. And then to make the ah after it, I have to open that closure and then start making an ah. And the key component of the ah that enables us to hear it clearly is our vocal folds are opening and closing very rapidly. Um, in the case of me, um, they're opening and closing about 80 times per second. For your average female, they're opening and closing about 200 times a second. And what Ajarian found was there were consistent differences in the amount of time between when, say, this labial closure for B was released and when the following vowel started having these uh, vocal cord vibrations. And these time differences were consistent between different types of consonant and then across languages and dialects. And um, <clears throat> Ajarian is not widely credited with having come up with this discovery of voice onset time as a core linguistic variable. Um, however, uh, he did come up with it and um, some historians of uh, linguistics in the West do acknowledge that now. So that's a good step forward. But um, the voice onset time was rediscovered in 1964 by Lisker and Abramson uh, in an article called Across Language Study of Voicing and Initial Stops. Um, so they are typically credited by people who don't know the history of the field with having come up with this theory, but it was actually Ajarian, the Armenian linguist who did um, um, 65 years earlier. So the key thing that's been discovered for human languages is there are basically three main categories of voice onset time that human languages choose from to make their stop consonants like P, T, or K, or B, D, or G. One set is called pre-voiced stops. And in these, um, you actually start voicing, uh, so vibrating or opening and closing your vocal folds while you're still making the closure for the stop consonant. So in the international phonetic alphabet, we represent these pre-voiced sounds as symbols like B, D, and G. And the next, type of consonant that human languages normally use are called short lag voiceless stops. And these have a voice onset time typically of between zero and 35 milliseconds. And in the International Phonetic Alphabet, we write these with P, T, K, and so on. And then the third type of series that human languages tend to use are called long lag voiceless stops. And these have a voice onset time of typically more than uh, 35 milliseconds. 
Interestingly, it's been found that not only do humans have these three categories, but actually non-human animals also have a perceptual boundary between the long lag voiceless stops and the short lag ones. So it's been found with chinchillas and rhesus macaques and pigeons and many other kinds of animals that um, they have a perceptual boundary between d and t, for example, or b and p. Even though they don't have languages themselves, uh, hu human type languages, as far as we know, they distinguish between these. So for example, you know about the classic Pavlovian conditioning paradigm with the dog and the bell and the food reward and the salivating. You can do that, say, um, in with a dog, for example, instead of ringing a bell, you can play them, say, a t. So something like ta with a long lag voiceless stop. And when you play ta, you have the food reward predictably come out. Um, but when you play something like da with a short lag voiceless stop, you have the food not predictably come out. And the dog will very quickly pick up on this predictive difference where hearing a long lag voiceless stop predicts the food reward, hearing a short lag one doesn't. Once the dog is picked up on that, you can then vary the voice onset time between say zero and 150 milliseconds and see which of those stimuli the dog responds to uh, by salivating, expecting the food. And it's found that um, they respond to stimuli whose VOT is longer than 35 milliseconds. So they have that same perceptual boundary as humans do. Um, <clears throat> in English, what we write as BDNG are typically actually short lag voiceless stops in word initial position. And in word initial position, what we write as PT and K in English are long lag voiceless stops. So in terms of the international phonetic alphabet, English really has T and the aspirated T, T with a superscript H. Whereas um, a language like Spanish has pre-voice stops which they write as BDG, et cetera. And they have short lag voiceless stops, which they write as PTK. So Spanish would have in word initial position, pre-voiced D and short lag voiceless D. English on the other hand would have short lag voiceless D and long lag voiceless T. In classical Armenian, and also in standard Eastern Armenian and in the Agulis dialect and a few others, what we call the group six dialects of Armenian, they actually have all three of these. So they have D, D, and T. Whereas in Istanbul, Western Armenian, for example, they have, um, this hasn't been properly studied, but to my ear, they seem to have the English type system, what we call an aspirating language, where they have short lag voiceless and long lag voiceless stops. But in Musaler and Kesab and Marash and Zaytun and so on, they have um, the Spanish series plus the aspirated series. So they have the same three series as classical Armenian, but with a twist that I'll show you in a second. So with this background about VOT, let's look at what exactly happened in the Armenian world and especially in Musa there. So with the original Indo-European voiced aspirates, uh, which we represent as a capital D followed by a superscript H. So this represents sounds B, D, G, G, and so on. Uh, a root like D, meaning to put, comes out in classical Armenian, uh, losing its aspiration. So you just get, instead of a d, you get a d. So denem, I put in classical Armenian. The original plain voice series, like in Dekimt 10 that I mentioned before, they devoice in classical Armenian. So they shift to the short lag voiceless category. And so from Dekimt, you get dasen in classical Armenian. And then the original Indo-European short lag uh, voiceless category represented by capital T 
moves into the long lag category. They become aspirated. So from okto or eight, you get ut with an aspirated T in classical Armenian. Then within the history of the Armenian family, these three series of uh, classical Armenian shift again. In Istanbul, Western Armenian, the old um, plain voiceless series or short lag voiceless series like Dasan shift over into the um, uh, D category or voiced category. So you, and you would get something like Dasa. Uh, and the original voiced series like Denem moves into the voiceless aspirated category. So you then get Tenem, may I put. And that merges with the old aspirated series. So Tenem and Ut. So standard Western Armenian merges from three series that classical Armenian had into two. Musaler and Kesab and Marash and so on, all the Southwestern Armenian dialects also merge, um, but in different ways. So the old uh, classical Armenian plain voiceless series becomes voiced. So dusa for 10 in Bityas, for example. Um, and the classical Armenian plain voiced series becomes voiceless. In other words, old D and T from classical Armenian switch with each other in the Southwestern Armenian dialects. So old Denem, for example, in Bityas becomes Denim with a voiceless T at the beginning. Uh, all Armenian varieties though keep the um, classical Armenian voiceless aspirates unchanged. By and large, we'll see there are some exceptions in final position in Musaler later. So for example, Ut comes out in Bichyas as Ute, as we'll see again later. So these consonant shifts uh, played a key role in differentiating Musaler and the other Southwestern Armenian dialects from the rest of the Armenian dialect world. To put it in slightly simpler form, if we start with the classical consonant series, D, D, and T, in standard Western, D becomes D, and then D and T merge into T, whereas in the Southwestern dialects, the D and D switch places with each other, which is quite interesting from a historical perspective. So this is actually a good giveaway for someone being from uh, either Cilicia or Syria, if they're Armenian, if they pronounce a classical um, D as a D and they pronounce a classical D as a D, then um, they probably are from either Cilicia or Syria. I see now, by the way, that um, I should have switched this D and T symbol in the bottom row here. Sorry about that. Okay, now let's consider what happens um, within the Southwestern Armenian dialect group. Within this area, uh, the Cilician dialects typically form one subgroup and then the Syrian dialects form another, where by Syrian, I'm including Musaler just over the current present day border. Um, and within this, Musaler often subgroups with Kesab in particular. So for example, Ajarian in his book on the uh, dialects of Cilicia, as he calls it, but he actually means the whole Southwestern group. He says that the Haji Habibli subdialect of Musaler as clean monophonal vowels. Whereas in the other two Musaler subdialects, where he means Yonaluk and Kabusie, and also in Antioch, which he means uh, Kesab by, uh, these vowels become diphthongal or have two parts in them. And he gives this example of the Lord's Prayer. I apologize to those of you who um, speak either Haji Habibli or Kesab dialect and don't agree with these renditions by Ajarian. He collected these a um, hundred years ago. The book wasn't published till 2003, but he did his field work um, quite a long time ago. And many people have reported to me that these forms don't exactly match with what they use today, but I'm gonna use them since that they're what he publishes. So um, <clears throat> as part of the Lord's Prayer, we have Ha'ermer 
Surb, this classical Yeritzi Anun Ko. So our father, um, may your name be holy <clears throat> or hallowed. In Haji Habibli, Ajarian says that the vowels are clean and monophthongal, so they just have one part. So for example, you get uv, uh, equivalent to ov for o or hu in uh, standard Armenian. So there's a monophthongal u, whereas in Kesab you get uv with a diphthong, meaning a vowel that has two parts, u and u, and so on. <clears throat> Similarly, um, for b, in the subjunctive, you get a no in Haji Habibli, according to Ajarian, whereas in Kesab, according to him, you get a new with this diphthong u. So um, having diphthongized vowels is a feature that groups together Kesab with a subpart of Musalir. Another feature where Kesab um, shares um, its structure with Musalir is the making of the future tense, where both use bur, which seems to be from classical Armenian bd, meaning it is necessary, and or, meaning that. So uh, over the uh, millennia, you get bd or reducing gradually and showing up in the end as bur. So, for example, in Tumanian's story, The Liar, Sudasana, you can see this in the part where uh, the king says, whoever can tell such a lie that I say that's false, I'll give them half my kingdom. And the I will give is the bit I've excerpted here. In Kesab, you get uh, Burdumer, where that's from Udum plus Bur, and they have this special rule in Kesab that when you put bur with an u initial form together, the u and the r switch. So you get burdum er. And in bitias, in musaler, you get bur udum er. <clears throat> so both use this bur future marker that's uh, distinctive to this region. However, sometimes musaler does not group with kesab. And this is the case for example, with the formation of the present tense. So in classical Armenian, you just had a bare verb form like berem for I carry. But in almost all dialects of modern Armenian, you have to have something extra to make the present tense. So g perem in standard Western Armenian, for example, or berumem in standard Eastern Armenian. On this slide, I've given you a plot of the main ways of making the present tense in Armenian dialects. Um, circled in purple in the bottom center of the slide are dialects that use ha or hi. Um, so for example, for he, she, or it says in Kesab, you would take um, hi and add the c for says, and you get hi c or he, she, or it says. You also get this construction, not just in Kesab, um, but also in Urfa, a bit farther north, in Malatya, in Agen, and then there's a pocket of uh, Ha dialect speakers in the far west of Anatolia in the Adapazar um, region. So Bardizag, Adapazar, uh, Nicomedia, and so on. Then over in the far east of the Armenian dialect world, we have this light purple area. And those are ones that use lis. You may know that in standard Eastern Armenian, if you have a monoconsonantal verb root, like um, de for give, or g for come, or l for cry, you use this lis to make the present. So la lisem, ga lisem, da lisem. But in these purple zones, they use lease for all present tense formations um, in some form. It often will, in uh, individual dialects, will reduce to either an L or to an S. So for example, you see uh, Payojuk here where um, Rafi was from. This is a variety of Salmast dialect. They would say something like Ertasen, where I um, go. 
where that's from Eritalisem, but it's reduced to Eritalisem. Um, then the red dots are all Gu varieties. Uh, so you can see that's mainly Western Armenian varieties. Um, the blue line here I've indicated is basically the border between Turkey and its neighbors. And the Gu dialects are um, typically to the west of that uh, line. Now, if you go down to Musalar and Kesab, you'll see there's a pocket of Gu dialects in this Ha zone. And that is the um, Musalar varieties and also the Aleppo variety of Armenian, which I would say is basically a variety of standard Western Armenian by and large. So, uh, Kes, uh, sorry, Musaler and also Beylan and also Aleppo are an island of Gu dialects sandwiched in between um, Kesab and some other Ha dialects. So, Kesab and Musaler don't always group together. Now, let's look at subdialects of Musaler. First, I have a challenge for you. I'm going to play you two recordings of the same thing, which is a passage from the liar story I mentioned earlier. And I want you to see if you can guess what two subdialects of Musaler these are. So I'm gonna play them first, then we'll put up the poll, and then I'll give you a chance to guess what they are. Okay, here's the first one. Vachten, tekavir magur, ger, gersi, er, jogobertain. Uv te söd mugesi, is gesim sodi, em takavortenes, gise brudum er. Okay, play one more time. Vachten, takavir magur, ger, gersi, er, jogobertain. Uv te söd mugesi, is gesim sodi, em takavortenes, gise brudum er. Okay. And here is the second variety. Söd husu. Gir uchikir takavir magir. Ash takavir er ashkaren meich er mani gutarnu. U garnu terza said bakhusa isa asim saidi. En takavrutenen gis gudum ani. Uvaiv ma guku guasi. Okay, I'm sorry, the recording quality was not great. I, I recorded that about 10 years ago on Skype before the Zoom revolution and Skype audio was not great. Okay, uh, Jora, will you put up the poll? The second poll? Yeah, poll number two. Okay. Here are the options. I want you to guess whether the first recording I played was Bityas, the second was Yolnoluk, or the first one was Haji Habibli, the second was Bityas, and so on. Now that you can see the options, I'm going to play the two recordings for you again. So here's the first one. Vachten, Takavir Magur, Ger, Garsi, Er, Jogobertain, Uv, Te Söd Magasi, is gasim sodi em takavortenes gise brudum er. All right, and here is the second variant. Söd husu. Gir uchikir takavir magir. As takavir er ashkaren meich er mani gutarnu. U garnu terza said bakhusa isa asim saidi. Okay, um, I'll play them one more time while I'm giving you a chance to pick your two dialects and then we'll go see what the answers are. Vachten, takavir magur, ger, garsi, er, jogobertain, uv, te söd magasi, is gasim sodi em takavortenes gise brudum er. And here is the second one, one last time. Söd husu. Gir uchikir takavir magir. 
աստակավիր էր աշխարեն մեջ էրմանի գուտարնում։ Ուվ գարնու տրզան Սայդ բխուսա, իսա ասիմ Սայդի, եմ տակավրութեն եմ գիս գուտում անել։ Ուվայվ մը գյուկու ուգասիմ։ Ակե, ես է։ So Jora, will you? Yeah, there we go. So it looks like Bityas and then Yovnoluk was the most popular guest. That was correct. So we must have a lot of Musalair people in the audience at this point. Um, <clears throat> yes, the first one was Garo Kadian from Bityas, who's been extremely helpful to me over the years. And the second was Hayar Narek who uh, helped me a lot, thanks to David Ulfasian about 10 years ago. <clears throat> it was from Yolmo Luke uh, community originally. Okay, so hopefully you could see from those samples that there actually are significant differences between the sub-dialects of Musalera. And these dialects have been observed in many of the written sources on, these, uh, on the Musalera dialect. And the basic pattern that emerges that pretty much everyone agrees on is there are three dialect regions, sub-dialect regions. The red area is called the Cabousier or Cabousier sub-dialect. And that was originally spoken apparently also in Chedlik and Marajuk. Then there was the Yolnoluk sub-dialect group spoken in Yolnoluk, Khadrbeg, uh, and Vakuf. And then higher up on the mountain, there was the Haji Habibli dialect, a sub dialect, which was spoken in Haji Habibli and Bityas, and according to some in Karachai. I'm a bit suspicious of that, but I've never met anyone from there. So if any of you have any inside information on that, uh, please email me or send a chat comment. So those are the sub dialects of Musalera. Now, here are some examples. Um, I've tried to pick a nice simple set so that you can get your head around the differences, um, but also so that there are enough differences to make clear that the two varieties are quite different. So representing the Haji Habibli sub-dialect, I have Bityas. Um, these forms are from Garo. He recorded them for me just a few weeks ago. And then representing the Yohnoluk subgroup, we have Khadrbek forms that uh, Hago Panosian kindly recorded for me uh, a few days ago. So first, let's listen to the BTS numbers. Mik, Ergek, Erk, Chik, Heng, Vitz, Yut, Et, En, Dus. So there you can see some features that are unusual in the Armenian dialect realm such as having a usual stop, like I mentioned at the beginning, the, the uh of mik uh, for one. And that's quite interesting because this is a native Armenian form. One wonders how a Q would have developed there. Also, bityas, along with several varieties of musalera, has front rounded vowels like u uh and u. Uh. So u uh in the number for two, erguk, and u uh in chuk. Whereas in Chutterbeck, uh, they don't have a, um, quite as many of these new vowels. So you would instead get uh, ergak and so on. So let's now compare uh, Hagop's production in the Chutterbeck variety. So we're going to start with Mie and go down this rightmost column to Dos. Mie, ergak, irk, choik, han, reitz, yut, ait. One point of interest here that I alluded to earlier is normally Armenian dialects keep the voiceless aspirated stops unchanged, like ut with a t, but um, Hagop and indeed many speakers in Musaler produces an unaspirated, unreleased t in the number for seven uh, and also in the number for eight. This um, sometimes happens in final position or before another consonant. And this unreleased phenomenon where you make the closure um, with your tongue and your palate or teeth, um, but don't release it at the end of the consonant, 
uh, that's represented with a half of a, a square in the International Phonetic Alphabet. So listen again to Hagop's numbers, paying attention to that uh, d instead of t in seven and eight. Me, ergat, irk, choik, han, reitz, yud, ait, oin, dos. So you can see there are quite a few differences between these two uh, members of two of the main subdialects of uh, Musaler. When you add in um, Kabusie and Haji Habibli, there are even more differences. So actually, each of the uh, six main villages has noticeable differences in the number system. I didn't include here um, because of time reasons, but I'll mention it now very quickly. Um, that many speakers of Musaler varieties have borrowed Turkish forms for um, 60, 70, 80, 90, if I remember correctly. It's either three or all four of those uh, decades. Um, <clears throat> and that actually is the norm in Western varieties of Armenian. So one spoken in the former Ottoman Empire. Um, so Musaler is pretty consistent in that sense. All right, now let's move on to some interesting archaisms or preservations that you find in the Musaler dialect. And after that, we'll look at some interesting innovations that the dialect has made. We're going to focus on a few morphological archaisms. And for innovations, we'll look at phonological ones. So first archaisms in the nominal declension or the way you form nouns. Um, <clears throat> in classical Armenian, the plural was normally almost always marked with an aspirated K suffix. So um, let's say you had gir for a letter or character. The plural of that would be girk, which obviously then ended up becoming the word for book, a collection of letters. But in modern Armenian dialects, that k has been replaced, and this was true already in medieval Armenian, by er and ner. So in late classical Armenian, and then in medieval Armenian, um, early medieval Armenian, it was yar and nyar, um, but those eventually became er and ner and replaced the k. But uh, according to Pashayan, who was from Haji Habibli and published a few articles on um, Musaler in the 60s, in his variety, if you have a noun that ends in a, it will still take as its plural marker the old classical Armenian aspirated k. So for example, uh, from Yegeratsi for church, in his variety, you get um, Giritsa for church, and then plural Giritsak, not Giritsa Ner. And um, <clears throat> from Gashi for uh, leather, I guess, you get Gisha and plural Gishak. Um, from Gahni, you get Gahna, Gahnak. From Maki for sheep, you get Maka, plural Makak, and so on. So there's an archaism in nominal declension, which is that the old classical plural aspirated K is preserved, but by and large only after a final um, nouns. I think there are other classes that preserve it too, but this is uh, a main category. Also, one of, uh, in classical Armenian, there were many ways of forming the instrumental. Um, so this is the instrumental is what you make with ov, in standard Armenian today. Um, but in classical Armenian, there were many instrumental endings. One of them for the um, ah declension was amb. And this comes out in Musaler as either um in um, the Haji Habibli group or as u in the Olnaluk group. So for example, for eat cheese with bread, and the instrumental is going to show up in with bread here. So instead of um, hatsov in standard Armenian with ov, you instead get um or u. So banera, hatsum, 
gear. And here we have the um instrumental. And notice also Hatz has a geminate or long s. That's another feature of interest in uh, Musalar dialects. Um, in Yolnoluk subdialect, the um has reduced further to u. But both of these are archaisms relative to the standard modern Armenian of instrumental, which is uh, a newer development. In the verbal conjugation or the way, uh, ways of making verbs, um, you also find archaisms. So in classical Armenian, there were four verb conjugations according to what vowel they uh, used before the endings. So there was an E conjugation like Cyril, an I conjugation like Chosil, an A conjugation like Charal, and an U conjugation like Tohul. In standard Western Armenian, they've merged these three, uh, four into three. So the E and I conjugation, uh, sorry, the U conjugation has disappeared and the individual verbs that were in it have merged into um, the other three categories. Standard Eastern Armenian has gone even farther and has merged conjugations one and two, the E and I ones, into the E conjugation. So they only have uh, the E and A conjugations left now in Standard Eastern. In Musaler, they've merged all four of them in the infinitive ending. So it's il for all of them. So siril, this is uh, according to Pashayan, by the way. Some of you Musalertsis may not agree with this, but in his Haji Habibli variety, this is the case. Siril, chusil, charil, tuhil. So all of them have the il infinitive suffix. However, when you put on the personal endings, uh, so like I do X or they do X, then the underlying theme vowels show up and you see that Musaler has preserved all four original classical conjugations intact. So the old E conjugation, conjugation one, comes out as an I. So geu sirim. The old I conjugation comes out with an E. So geu chusem. The old a conjugation, conjugation three, comes out as u, um, go harum, and the old u conjugation, conjugation four, comes out with a in Pashayan's dialect. So go turam. Not all Musalera subdialects have this a outcome of class four, um, but that's what uh, Pashayan had in the 60s. <clears throat> so the key is. Musaler has preserved all four classical Armenian verb conjugations, unlike standard Western and standard Eastern Armenian. Now let's move on to phonological innovations in Musaler. First, there's this uvular stop Q, which is extremely rare in the Armenian dialect word world. So it shows up in loan words like makaf, which uh, we heard hago produce at the beginning today for the village Vakuf. Um, and also Yunuluk, uh, many speakers produce that with a voiceless uvular stop at the end. Those are both borrowings into uh, most of our dialect from um, neighboring languages. But you also find the cue showing up in native Armenian words, interestingly. So we heard Garo say mik for one, and we heard Hagop for he, she, or it found it say Yakaltze with a k from the original classical Armenian G. So you get innovation of this mysterious uvular stop in native words, not just being borrowed in foreign words. And then perhaps the most noticeable innovation in Musaler is the vowel system. There's been a large series of vowel shifting that has happened. And um, Yohnaluk has the largest vowel system as a result. But I'm going to play you examples from Hagop system in Hutterbeck dialect. And we're going to start with the short vowels. And we're going to go from E to U, E, U, E, E, A, A in order. 
And these are <clears throat> organized in terms of those vowels showing up in the Ognoluk, in Andre Asian's um, variety of it in his 1967 book. Hüderbeck has fewer of these vowels, but you'll still hear many of them going on. And, what, and you're gonna hear in the recording from Hagop in a second, first the English form, then the classical form, but pronounced in Western Armenian, then the Hüderbeck dialect form, then the Olnoluk, um, he doesn't pronounce the Olnoluk form. So I just put them here in the chart for comparison. So we're gonna start with oil, and the classical for oil and Hudrebeck for oil, then move down the chart. Oil, you, ir, all, olor, pilur, foot, woden, wood, belt, kodi, kuda, price, kin, ken, owl, pu, pe, knife, tanak, Tanag, cross, hach, hach. So we can see a number of interesting features here. One you find in Armenian dialects today in general, which is the old classical Armenian diphthongs have reduced to monophthongs. So like you, written I-W in classical Armenian, is an E now in the word for oil, E. Secondly, you can see that um, Hörderbeck and Musseler in general has developed an U, a front high rounded vowel, like in the word for all, Bülü. Um, thirdly, you can see that Musseler has long or geminate consonants, even in final position in a word, which is very rare across linguistically. So like vd with a long D or foot. That long D comes from the assimilation of D N, that or originally T N in the classical word for foot. Um, you can also see that Yogmaluk subgroup has developed an U, uh, like we heard in one of uh, Garo's numbers for BTS earlier. Um, that's actually from the Haji Habibli subdialect. But in Hudderbeck, that uh doesn't seem to show up and it unrounds to a, so be or owl instead of be, the Yonoluk form from Atreasian. Thirdly, or fourthly, or fifthly, you can see that um, Musaler has an a that um, you don't find in standard Armenian. So danug for knife. Um, <clears throat> and then finally, Yohnoluk variety, as described by Andre Asian, has a long a ah, as opposed to a short a. Ah. So they have a ah and a. Ah. But uh, Hudderbeck doesn't seem to have that contrast. Now let's move on to diphthongs. These are vowel sounds that have two parts to them, like el or yeah, that kind of thing. Here are some examples of diphthongs that show up in Hagop's Hüderbeck variety. Um, in this recording I'm gonna play you, uh, Hagop produces the English gloss, then the classical form produced in Western Armenian way, and then the Hüderbeck form. And then we'll go down the chart in that way. So starting with last. Last or final, Hedin, Iddain, Spring, Karun, Karun, you, to, teun, wherever, your, yaur, awake, artun, artong. So this is just a sampling of five of the diphthongs that Hagop's uh, Hüderbeck variety has. Um, Andre Asian reports in his Yolnaluk variety 31 different diphthongs. <clears throat> whether those are actually uh, accurately reported and whether they're still alive today in Yolnaluk speakers remains to be verified. But there's plenty to keep us busy in Hagop's variety here. So we see I um, as a diphthong and one manifestation of I 
that I find amusing is in the word for eight, um, which is either it or ita, I can't remember which. Um, let's see. Eight. Um, that sounds like the Australian English number for eight, eight. So Hederbeck and Australian English end up with the same word for eight, which I find highly amusing. Okay, now let's go back to the diphthongs. So Hederbeck has an I, as another long D like we saw in foot. It has ash in garaun. It has eu, this eu diphthong that many Muslim varieties have. But it also has eu um, in the word for you singular. It has au like in yaur, and it has au like in artaun. Um, so these uh, diphthongs are completely distinctive to the Syrian varieties of um, Armenian, by which I mean specifically Musaler and then um, Kassab and Aramo and Belan and so on. I'm not counting Damascus and Aleppo. <clears throat> and obviously Vakafla is not in Syria, but I group it together with the Syrian dialects. <clears throat> the next interesting phenomenon I alluded to at the beginning today, which is only found in a subset of Musalar varieties, which is deletion of the definite article that typically then has knock-on effects on the preceding vowel. So let's say you have Yerechan Nastadzer Kednim in standard Western Armenian. So that Yerechan is the child. Nastadzer is, was seated, kednim, on the ground. In Bitias dialect, the um, word yerecha is not used. Instead, they use this Turkish borrowing, chujoch, uh, for child. And you add on the definite article to make the child, so chujocha. Um, so you get chujocha um, nastudzi kidain as we'll hear here, produced by Garo. And the key for our purposes right now is you just get a straightforward O and then the definite article schwa, uh, uh, like you get in most kinds of Armenian. But in Vakuf, for example, they delete the definite article and lengthen the preceding vowel. So for um, a child, you get Chujauch, but for the child, you get Chujauch with a long ow. So you end up getting Chujauch, Nesteuds, Kidnen. And notice they also delete the auxiliary verb, E. So instead of getting Nesteudzi, you delete the I and then lengthen the U to EU. So Nesteudzi comes out as Nesteuds. So here is Vahak pronouncing this in Vakuf dialect. So that's a significant difference, not only between Vakuf, for example, and Yolnoluk on one hand, and say Bityas on the other, but between Vakuf and Yolnoluk and all other varieties of Armenian. This loss of the definite article with compensatory lengthening of the preceding vowel is very, very unusual in Armenian and in the languages of the world in general, in fact. And <clears throat> this loss of the definite article produces a range of interesting alternations in the Yolnoluk subdialect. So that's Yolnoluk, Hrebek, um, <clears throat> that we talked about before, and Vakuf. So here are some examples in Hago Panosian's uh variety of the Yonaluk subdialect. So we're going to start with hand up in the upper left, and he's going to read across. Uh, so Tsar will be hand, Tsar will be the hand, and then I'll say it means hand. And then for comparison, I've given you the classical Armenian forms that they came from in the right hand column. Here we go. Tsar, Tsor, hand. Tsun, Tsain, snow. Shon, Shaun, dog. 
Zhang, Zhang, Zung, Ni, Mac, Ma, Mouse, Most, Most, Man, Pirun, Pireun, Mouth, and the Mouth, Build, Boil, Navel, Jijir, Jijoir, Swallow, Hanzuch, Hanzeu, Firebrand, Seared, Soil, Heart, Zen, Zain, Horse, and the Horse, Tanuk, Tane, Knife, and the Knife, Irgung, Irgeng, Milestone, Millstone, and the Millstone, Keun, Kaun, Sleepy. Okay, so you can see uh, there is a, a very complex and systematic structure of alternations between bare nouns like hand and definite forms of them like the hand, where in other kinds of Armenian, you have a very simple way of marking that contrast, namely by adding uh to make the definite. But in the Yolnuluk subgroup, including uh, Hrdebek and Vakuf, you get this change where definiteness is marked by changes in length and quality of the last vowel of the root. Okay, let's end up now with a fun bit of culture uh, involving something I like to work on, sun showers. There's actually a question about sun showers in the manual for collection of Armenian dialect forms, which I mentioned to you near the beginning today. So this was um, produced by Muradian et al. in 1977. It's an amazing document. It's very, very helpful for collecting material from Armenian dialect speakers. Um, if any of you are interested in doing that with yourselves, if you speak a dialect or with your grandparents or whatever, and you'd like to see this um, manual to get an idea of the kind of questions you can ask, uh, feel free to email me. So question 12 in this manual is Arev Yehanagin Paragansrev. So light rain and sunny weather. And you're supposed to ask your dialect speaker, what do they say when you have light rain that falls while the sun is shining? And they give some answer options in the manual, like Arev Mar, which literally means sun siv, Arev Tsoh, sun dew, Gotashar, stem dew. And um, those are not all that interesting to me compared to what we're gonna see in a second. Um, you can add to this list another fairly pedestrian expression, uh, Baruk Ansrev in Marash dialect. Uh, Paran Sanens told me this once, uh, it literally means thin rain. But actually when you look around in the Armenian world, most varieties of Armenian have very interesting expressions for what I call the sun shower in English. For example, in uh, Derer, in the Hmerzin region, they say Gilu Harsanik, meaning wolf wedding. And in other parts of the Armenian world, you can see uh, Gulashar in Karabakh, Gilatsnuk, so these are wolf rain, wolf birth, Gelsiknuk, wolf birth again, and so on. And if you pull back and look at the Armenian world as a whole, what you find is there are five main types of expression in the traditional Armenian world. There are expressions involving a wolf giving birth. Those are represented by the red dots here on the map. So like in uh, Tiflis and in the Hmyadzin region, over into Karabakh and Azerbaijan and so on. Deer birth expression. So like the deer is giving birth on the mountain. You find that in Sivas here. Wolf weddings are very common. Those are, well, they are in general, not so much in the Armenian world, but you find some like that in Armenia itself. Uh, bird wedding, so the birds are getting married, is used up in the Hamshen region, right on the border with Georgia. And then several varieties of Armenians say the devil's beating his wife. Those are the green ones here. Um, 
in Ein Tab, for example, also in Damascus and so on. Interestingly, the devil's beating his wife is what Americans in the south of the United States tend to say also, and it's found in parts of France and many other parts of the world. So this is all culturally interesting, but what about this white dot here where Musalair is? I've left out what the answer for that is. So what do you think is the Musalair expression for a sun shower when rain falls while the sun is shining? Well, Hagop informs me that he says, Ariv and Sariv Tibignira Harasnak. So Ariv sun and Sariv rain. Uh, Tibignira is uh, the jackals and Harasnak is wedding. Uh, so sun and rain, jackals, wedding. And this is very, very similar to what Andre Asian mentions in his 1967 book. Uh, so in his Yovnaluk variety, he has sun and rain, the jackals are getting married. And you also find variants of this in Kesav. So for example, Solag Apelyan um, tells me that in Kirkune, um, they say, Tibignen has nekhainin. So Tibignen is the jackals, has nek is wedding, and then hainin is that high for present tense, plus an L to do. So they are doing a wedding. And George Tertarian, whose uh, parents were from Kesab and Delzaraj, says, Erivek and Srivek Tibigun Harsnek. So, sun, rain, jackal's wedding, or he says, he translates it as coyote's wedding. Coyote is a type of jackal. <clears throat> so, jackal's wedding seems to be within the Armenian world, particular to this little uh, region that we've been focusing on today, uh, Kesab Musalar type area. However, you find jackals weddings in a wide swath of the world's cultures. So in Africa, the languages of Morocco typically will say uh, some form of the jackals are getting married. So in Moroccan Arabic, um, you find Dib uh, and so on. In Tashalhit and Tamazik Berber, similarly, that you say jackals are getting married. In Algeria, um, some of the languages have the same expression. In Namibia, the same, and also in South Africa. So, for example, in Afrikaans, they say Yakals Trau met Wolf Sevral. So, uh, jackal uh, is wedding with the uh, wife of the wolf. Interestingly, the Arabic varieties spoken around Musalair itself don't seem to say jackal's wedding. It's only these ones in North Africa, as far as I've found so far. So in the Syrian and Lebanese varieties of Arabic, what I tend to hear is some variant of wolf's wedding or fox's wedding or rat's wedding or lizard's wedding. So I remember, for example, the, um, <clears throat> the guys from uh, Jerusalem who worked at the Lebanese uh, slash Palestinian restaurant as they build it in um, Harvard Square said, Firan bi Jawazo, the rats are getting married. <clears throat> Moving back to Jackal's wedding, it's also extremely common in languages of South Asia. So you find the Jackal's wedding expressions in Bengali, Bihari, Garo, which is the Sino Tibetan language. Hindi, Malayalam, which is a Dravidian language, Punjabi, Pashto, Sinhalese, and so on. And you find it in um, Mazandarani, an Iranian language in Iran. So the notion of a jackal's wedding to express a sun shower is actually quite common in the world. So that's a little overview of the Musalar dialect and its varieties and how they fit into the Armenian world and the Indo-European world. I hope it was interesting to you. Um, unlike many times when I give a presentation on an Armenian dialect, um, there's a slightly positive note one can end on, which is in this new social media age, there have actually been some groups that have in the past few years been extremely active in documenting Musalair dialect 
both in videos of older speakers, which are the best thing in my opinion, but also in publishing uh, digital versions of folk tales and so on. And two that I'll single out because I'm particularly impressed by them are uh, Shuach Shock, which you can find on Facebook. I've given their URL here. And also Anjari Lazul. Um, both of these have a lot of great materials they've been churning out over the last few years. Um, and if you're interested in Kesab, there's also a Kesab uh, Facebook group that's extremely uh, active in producing specifically Kesab dialect materials. So there are good ways now to hear uh, these dialects. And um, I hope that you'll check those out. And if you're a speaker yourself, you'll, continue, you'll consider making your own videos of yourself, your parents, your grandparents, your relatives. And if you do, please let me know. The, the more we can collect, the better. And also the more of an online presence we can create, the better, because arguably that gives kids more incentive to uh, value these varieties and take an interest in learning them and speaking them. So thanks very much. Thanks especially to uh, Hago Panosian, who helped me a lot over the past week in collecting video and audio materials. Um, <clears throat> and also Garo Kadian, who's helped me an incredible amount over the years but also to many others uh, on the list here who have been extremely helpful to me in documenting the Muscular dialect. Thank you very much. <laughs>